get one? Yeah, yours is already in the back. Is it put a layer on in here? Yeah, it might not hurt. Can somebody over here be my... We didn't get you? Sir, we got you. Put your name on that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Is there more chairs I can go get? Uh, yeah. Keith? We got some more chairs we can roll in here? More chairs? Who else doesn't? There you go. Oh boy. Going to be coming in. You better take some of these tables down next to you. As soon as Keith gets in here, we'll get started. Uh, who's my slide guy? You would advance me one? Anyway, <laughs> in this case I get laryngitis and we just slide these or show these slides. My name is Bill Rinker and my call is W6OAV and I'll introduce the two other guys when they get back in here. The first night is always a mess trying to get set up and everything so the rest of the month or two months whatever it is we'll probably start right on the dot and try to end at nine right on the dot because we got a lot of stuff to cover. And we'll get into that in a bit. Anyway, since the other folks haven't come in, I'll start. What I want to do is real quick, like go around the room, have each one of you give your name, give your call, uh, anything you want to say about packet, as far as uh, don't know anything about it, hate it, or whatever. <laughs> and uh, what some of the other things like you'd like to do in ham radio are, you might give a brief word on the type of work you do and some of your other hobbies, because you may find other people have a have a commonality in here so we hope this is kind of a way of people meeting people as well as learning about packet. I've been in amateur radio since uh, 57 and uh, my big love is HF Mobile and uh, home brewing and antennas and this sort of thing. <coughs> packet was a natural for myself and Joe, my helper here when he comes in. We both uh, well, he used to work for AT&T, now works for US West, but we've been in telecommunications for more years than I hate to, uh, hate to mention, or like to mention. And we were involved in the commercial version of this stuff, so when AX.25 came along, it was just a matter of seeing, well, how does it differ? So if you ask me what books I recommend, I can't tell you I've never read any, because I didn't have to, I just hadn't had the background. And uh, when I saw so many people struggling, and I didn't really the few books I went through, I didn't see anything that really covered a lot of this stuff. We decided to go ahead and start running some classes. We made up some slides. We ran one class, and that was going to be the end of it. And here we are, three years later, still doing it. So, of course, like everything else, we'd have done everything a lot differently if we'd have known it was going to grow into this. Joe? Yeah, well, I'm Joe, KF0OD, and uh, I guess my interest in packet is very uh, primordial. I, I don't have, I've got a computer, no TNC. No, just about nothing. Yeah, uh, WA9 IPK. Um, I worked pretty close to Bill there <laughs> over at AT&T. I used to work with the protocol too, but I never got into packet radio. I uh, thought it sounded kind of interesting. Always wanted to get involved in it, so this way I get to see what it's like from the beginning to the end, I guess. And um, as far as ham radio, I'm, over the last few years I haven't done too much. I used to work a lot of CW on 40 meters and that kind of stuff. I used to like. And, two meters in the car and that type of thing, but as Bill knows, I'm kind of a laid-back ham now. <laughs> oh, and all of a sudden we wound up uh, first-class facilities here, so Keith has done a lot of work. I helped him, that's where I was for the last 15 minutes, I helped him make up three of these name tags. I didn't realize how much work he put in name tags, so he deserves a big hand. <laughs> He's the uh, president, by the way, of the Denver Radio Club, and uh, they're in there with us on this. Keith? And I used to teach in the bathroom, so I've never seen it this packed. So, <laughs> if you get warm or anything, let me know. I, we, we do control this room individually with air conditioning. <laughs> so One of the problems you have when you fool around with this stuff, you get to the point where some things are so obvious to you that you just kind of skip over them because it doesn't occur to you that it's not obvious to somebody that hasn't been beating their, their head against the wall because sometimes in packet it's like... Uh, 
computer programmers and computer operators, you've probably heard that, th that saying, blessed is he who talks to inanimate objects. He shall be known as a computer operator. <laughs> or you can make that packet operator too. Can I the next slide? Whoops. You back up one? One more? Well, okay, we're missing one. Uh, that's fine right there. I should have double checked these before we came in. Anyway, there was a slide that's supposed to come up here that's a puzzle. We see it. Okay, that's the slide there. And basically what that's uh, symbolizing is our objective. We want to lead, lead you through the maze of packet radio because it is a maze. Put together the pieces of the packet puzzle for you. And then, of course, answer any of your questions. And we're going to cover terminology. You know, what's a wormhole, backbone, CSMA, and all that type of thing. We're going to talk about protocols. What is AX.25? What is ASCII? What's TCPIP.V.24? Spent a lot of time talking about hardware, TNCs, RS-232, gateways, nodes. Talk about the network, how it works, what it is, how to use it, and uh, these kind of things. Then what we intend to do after we go through the normal seven weeks is, if there's enough interest, and I think there will be, uh, we will set up in the weeks following each evening a particular TNC, like a 232 or a CAM, and we'll have the different software packages here so you can see them operate. Okay, so I'll give you a good feel for uh, all the different software that's out there too, as well as the TNCs, hands-on stuff, see it all in operation. And that'll give you a good, good feel for the way you want to go because they always, you always hear the question, what kind of TNC should I buy? Well, it depends on what you want to do. And we'll get into that. These uh, following slides basically give an overview of what we're going to cover. We're going to have an overview of what is the network? What are the components of our network? What is switching and routing and packet? These kind of things, just a rough overview. Then we're going to go into the station components. We're going to talk about terminals versus computers. You don't really need a computer to run packet. It gains you a lot, but you don't need it. You can have a $10 dumb terminal if you want. Uh, we're going to talk about the TNC, what it does. RS-232, modems, protocols. We're going to talk about the radio. Then, probably about the third week from now, it's going to get heavy in here. We're going to talk about the actual frames. There's three categories of them. There's ten types. We're going to talk about what their functions are. We're going to talk about their bit structure, how they're built up, how they work. There it is. <laughs> you can tell we are very coordinated tonight. We're going to get into, again, terminology, DTE versus DCE. We're going to talk about setting up a link, sequencing, error detection. How does the TNC know the other guy got it error free or didn't get it error free? All that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about how you act something, how you reject something, flow control, windowing, timers, disconnects, round tabling. Then we're going to get heavy into the network. I say this is just kind of an index of what we're going to cover. We're going to get into how does the thing work? What are the limitations? What are the advantages of all this kind of stuff? All these terms that probably don't mean anything to you. I mean, that's a very romantic word right there, but that's one of the neatest things we got, wormholes. They're great. Talk about uplinks, downlinks, circuits, crosslinks, backbones, level two versus level three. Then we'll get into what maybe most of you really want to get into, but you're going to have to suffer to get here. It's kind of like going to the mission. <laughs> got to listen to the sermon if you want to hear the good stuff. But we're going to tell you how to really use the network, how to explore it. That's probably my biggest thing. I spend more time just seeing where I can go and how many bands I can go through to get to where I want to go, just exploring. I spend more time doing that than anything else. But we're going to get really heavy into to how to use this system and what it is. Then we're going to get into the thing that drives a lot of people crazy. How do you set this TNC up? What are all these crazy options you got in this book this, this thick with very fine print? You know, what do these options do and how do they do it? How to set up your, your terminal or your PC. This stuff is now obsolete. It's going to be changed to basically we're going to have a CAM. We're going to have a PK-232, an MFJ. We'll have the computer. We'll have the software. And we'll show you how to operate all of that stuff. 
when we originally set up the class, it was just to show club members how to operate our, our club station. And it's kind of expanded to, to this, so all of this has changed. So that, in a nutshell, is kind of what we're going to uh, cover. Any uh, questions on that? Okay, well, let's get into what Packet Radio offers you. Um, one of the things I'll mention, Les called on the radio, and he had to turn and go back. Les Carey, K0PGM, which a lot of people probably know. Um, when he's here, you'll hear he and I going at it. He talks about how terrible Packet is. I talk about how wonderful it is. A lot of people think we're serious on the radio. I've even written articles about him in the roundtable. But anyway, uh, he is one of the biggest supporters of Packet we have. One of the biggest. So when he's here next week, uh, and you hear these comments, I'd have probably made three or four of them by now. And he'd have had a resp uh, response for it. Uh, you know, like I say, he's, he's one of our best ones, so don't take him seriously. We found out some people have. <coughs> one guy came up to me and says, have you guys ever come to blows? <laughs> I said, no, we're not serious. Anyway, uh, Packet Off Radio offers air-free communications. In other words, theoretically, if you were sending data at 9,600 bits of information per second, continuously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, continuously, you could send that data for 3,000 years and maybe one error might slip through. That's pretty reliable. Anybody here some data communications, you probably wear CRCs and all that, CRC 16. Extremely error free. You mentioned you were in RIDI. There's one bad thing about packet. When you misspell or make typos, you can't blame conditions. <laughs> that was a nice thing about RIDI. If you got garbage in the other end or misspellings or letters transposed, you just blamed it on conditions. See, now you got to get a good speller because they know. It's error free. Gives you very efficient frequency uh, utilization. You get many frequencies, I mean, many stations on the same frequency at the same time. They share the frequency, and we'll get into that a little bit more. So that's kind of a nice thing about packet. It takes everybody that's all over the band, puts them on one frequency, and then they fight each other. <laughs> and that clears the band for everybody else. Worldwide networking. You can talk all over the world on packet through this network that exists. And we're going to give you some examples later on. I'm going to play a tape recording and show you something here very shortly of just a little thing I did last night. Uh, it's a natural communications mode for computers. Because of the way it works, it can transmit any digital code. It can be uh, binary, it can be ASCII, EBCDIC, just plain old bits, anything you want, you can, you can transmit over this thing. What that gives you is mode independence. You can transmit voice, you can transmit video, transmit facts, as well as information. There are people up in uh, Boulder that are, are on uh, uh, amateur TV and they're using uh, packet. You get an air-free picture. There's no glitches and whatever in it, air-free. It's a little slow right now, but uh, as data compression techniques are improved, it's getting faster. And we're gonna see a lot of advancement in that area. You probably heard here that AT&T just announced here the other day that they have a picture phone now color that will go over a regular old phone line, three kilohertz bandwidth. And that's a video signal, 10 frames per second. Wasn't very long ago, that was unheard of. But they got some uh, data compression algorithms that are incredible. And that's gonna carry over into this stuff. What we're seeing right now in packet is crude by standards of about five years from now. But when I see where we were five years ago, we've come a long ways. So it's kind of like the transition from AM to sideband for you that were there in those days. I mean, it was really kind of crude and rough and expensive in those days, but look where we're at now and, and what you gain by it. So you're kind of coming in in the, uh, the bottom floor there. You get a very high throughput. You'll see a lot of arguments about which is faster, RIDI, Amtor, or Packet. If you could do it right, Packet is faster. For you, the, those of you that get the round table, we uh, published an article about a year ago where we ran some tests just to show this. And uh, the people that uh, 
say that Ridi and uh, Amtor are faster. I haven't really run packets the right way. And that's one of the reasons we're running the class here. Kind of a selfish motive. If everybody runs the network right, our, everybody's throughput goes up. So that's another reason we like to try to train everybody. The other reason we run the classes is there is one string attached, but not a very, one, very big one. What I'd like you to do is to fill this out, put your name, your uh, call, your home phone, if you want, and circle whatever capabilities you have. And if you're willing to be called up as an emergency operator, in the event of emergency, uh, on, a, on the W0TX, the Red Cross packet station, or Ares, anybody that runs packet, if you put a little y, uh, y here, this is what we get in return for the classes. We do get a bunch of digital trained operators that we can rely on for emergency communications. Okay? If you don't want to, that's fine. I mean, that's, you know, you're already volunteered. It's too late. <laughs> okay, let's look at what Packet Radio offers. Can you focus that in just a little bit? Can you reach up there? There's a big black knob, right? There you go. Or is it my eyes? There we go. Okay, here's some of the things, and there's more because this is an old slide. Packet Radio offer, uh, offers keyboard to keyboard. You just sit there and you type with somebody. Okay? Now, a lot of people say, well, to sit there and keyboard back and forth, eh, it's easy to pick up a mic. Well, what a lot of people do, and what I do every weekend, I set up channels to California on 20 meters. I go through what's called a gateway to two meters. I connect to four or five different people I know out there, and we leave the connection up all weekend. I'll walk by and I'll see some stuff on my screen from one or two of them, and I'll answer them and ask them a question or whatever. Later on, they come in, they see it, they answer me back. And we carry a CUSO, a CUSO all weekend, all five of us, without anybody sitting down and spending a lot of time. You can ham and not get in trouble with the XYL, see? <laughs> so we, we talk all weekend, the entire weekend. Uh, I guess we need a little refocus there again. I think the slides are a little cold or something. There we go. So anyway, uh, a lot of people use what you might call non-real-time, but just continuous keyboard to keyboard. You'll see a lot of people sitting there, and I do this a lot. You know, you can say you can type pretty fast. But uh, this, is, this is kind of one of the neat things, is just to carry these ongoing uh, QSOs like this. You've got what I call the ham answering machine. You'll come down, take a look at your pack station. There's three or four messages from somebody. You'll read them. Oh, George sent me one. I'll send him an answer back. You sent me one. I'll send you one. Rick sent me one. I'll send him one. Okay. And then later on, they'll see these things in their mailbox, and they'll send mail back and, and, and things like that. I've gotten to the point now, a lot of times, I don't even bother calling some of the guys on packet. I just send them a message, things like that. Yeah. Works out real well. For uh, you that uh, are into DXing, they have what's called a, uh, a DX cluster. And this is like a, uh, a bulletin board, if you're familiar with bulletin boards. You connect to this thing, and you may have 50, 60, 100 people connected to this thing, and some of these BBSs, these DX clusters, are linked with other ones around the country or around the state, depending on where you're at. Somebody sees a DX station certain frequency, they put the information in, saying there's uh, YX29 on 14103, and he's very strong. I often suspect they wait till they work him, and then they put it in. Mm. See? <laughs> and it will automatically, if you set yourself up right, it will automatically appear on your screen and ring your bell. So anytime anybody updates the system, it updates you. Okay. Then they have all kinds of, uh, of uh, files on these things where it'll tell you that uh, uh, today at 3 o'clock, the best path to Europe is on 20 or whatever. Okay, all kinds of DX related programs. Telling you best time, best frequency, best place. Uh, you can send messages, you can see who's on the system, you can send a message to any one person, you can send a message to all people, so you can sit there and talk while you're doing all this. Anybody here ever use one? Got any comments on those? I don't use them enough to, to be into it. Just in that last uh, 
SAT, we used some clusters. That was just a random method. That was for that emergency uh, simulation? Yeah, I need to talk to uh, Bob on that because unfortunately I was tied up that night and I couldn't, uh, couldn't get in on it. But uh, anyway, uh, I know several people, Dean, AC0S, who hates Packet, but he's a nut as far as DX. So he went out and bought a TNC and welded all the frequency switches on that frequency that this <laughs> Packet cluster is on and it never changes. Okay. Yeah, that's part of the system. There's one in Boulder, one in Denver, I think one in Pueblo. Spotting board. Yeah, spotting board. They're all intertied, so they update each other. Okay. Uh, quite often, I'll get on HF and I'll log into a DX cluster like on the East Coast and see what they're seeing. And I'll wait till right around towards sunset because then I know the skip is going to get longer. So maybe I'll have a advance notice that the guy is on and he's going to be heard here before the guys here hear him. See, these things exist on HF too. I'm not a DXer, but I can see how you can get real shifty as a DXer because I got kind of shifty and I'm not even one by doing things like that. See? <laughs> okay, now here's a big one. BBS systems. Everybody know what a BBS, a bulletin board system is? Anybody not know? Okay, basically, basically it's a computer that you can log into and you can leave mail for people there so when they log in it'll tell them or you can pick up your mail when they leave it for you. You can download files just like on a regular computer. You can download information files. You can download programs. Uh, you can upload programs, uh, you can run programs, excuse me, all kinds of things. So it's a remote computer that you can log into over the packet channels. They have the same thing on telephone lines. Okay? And these BBS systems provide a lot of fabulous services. First one is the mail system. Uh, if you get on the frequencies that have these BBSs, you'll see them come up periodically and say mail for and they'll list all the calls and you'll say oh there's my call so you log in and it says here's mail from so and so and so you read it if you want you can leave a piece of mail for him and it will beacon his call out ID his call out periodically uh, you like I say you have these files general information files uh, computer programs packet maps to show you where all the network equipment is that we're going to talk about. All kinds of neat things like that. Then there's uh, some fascinating thing called automatic mail forwarding. All these BBS's know each other. And I send messages to California and to Tokyo quite regularly. I log into this local BBS and I type send private because I read a lot of the people reading it, you know, just because it clutters the frequency. Uh, send private, J-A-1-Y-N-E, at sign, and what's called his home BBS, the BBS that's located there in Tokyo on two meters. And I type the message, sign it, and usually about eight to 12 hours later, it's sitting on that board in Tokyo, and it goes via Australia. The messages that I send to California take anywhere from an hour to three hours to wind up on the two meter BBS in California. Are you starting out on HF here? Or are you VHF. Two meters, here? two meters. Yeah. There are ones on, on HF too, but most of them, most of the BBSs stay on HF. I'm sorry, VHF. And then they pass the traffic amongst themselves on HF. It's all automatically forwarded. Okay. I one time, well, I won't go into the story because you won't understand it because I haven't covered the net. But anyway, I was going to give you an example of how wild it can get, but the point is uh, you can send messages anywhere in the world by just getting on, in this case, 145.05, connecting to the local BBS, saying send this to Germany or send this to wherever, putting the text in and then closing it out, and it will go there, okay? And it uh, takes very little time. If we have a, a solar flare where the bands go dead, it may take a couple days. But if the conditions are normal, it's just a few hours. So you can send a message to any ham this way. If you want to send a message to a non-ham, 
There's a special way you go into the BBS. It's called the National Traffic System. You've probably heard of this. You know, the guys used to get on there with Morse code and uh, cue signals and all that when they used to handle traffic by voice. Yeah, I guess a lot of it still goes on. But you get into this system, you say, I want to send this to uh, Orlando, Florida, zip code, whatever it is, whatever the zip code is down there, and then you put the phone number. It will be forwarded to the nearest BBS system in Orlando, and then people that handle traffic will log in and see what mail is there, and they'll say, oh, okay, when I used to do it here, I had a list of zip codes that were all local calling areas to me. And I'd say, oh, I can handle that one. So I would call the people up and I'd read the message to them. Now, I didn't touch a pencil because what I'd do is I'd log in the BBS, I'd see that message, I would pull it off into my hard drive in my computer, call the people up, read it off to them, okay? And I'd say, is there anything you want to say back to this person? They'd say, yeah, tell them this. Type it, push a button up to the BBS, back over there and wherever that was in Orlando, guy would pull it off, call, pass it on. So you can use this system to send to non-hams as well. Pack it faster than NTS to, to uh, Europe. I'm sending NTS messages uh, to Italy and it takes anywhere from two or three months to get there. Oh, I know it's faster than that. It's within a day. <laughs> packet. See, packet is a natural for de disaster communications because when it when it's typed on the board, or typed into the computer and then goes out the TNC to the other end, like say the Red Cross if it's an emergency. When it gets there, it's on their hard drive, it's air free. What, eight to ten hours to get to Italy? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably depends on where in Italy. I, I've sent messages to Italy and it's taken you know less than a day to get there. But I've sent it to Rome and, and Venice. Now I haven't sent it to uh, No Trees Italy. Yeah. You know. It, you know, I don't know what kind of system they have, but I hear it's pretty good. But packet is a natural for message handling because it's air-free, it gets there, nobody touches a pencil, dump it to a printer, hand it to somebody. If I pass traffic on uh, NTS to the traffic system on, on two meters. Oh, okay. I hear them up there, but I don't know anything about it. I've never gotten into that. Does it route itself? Mm-hmm. You, you don't have to know what the route No, all you do is you have to know the home BBS. See, so, and, and that's it. And it will automatically get it there. All these BBSs know each other. Now, your TNC has what some people call a personal BBS. Mm -hmm. In other words, I can, if you had one of these, like a, a, a PK-232 or a CAM, I could leave a message in your personal BBS. And somebody else could leave a message in your, PB, your BBS for me. But those will never go anywhere. Those are just personal BBSs. The message handling BBSs have routing tables in there. And anytime somebody puts one of these on the air, they have a procedure that spreads the information out like on a tree. And it knows that if I can't get there direct, I can go there and go over there. Give an example. I went on 20 meters off to uh, Boston one day, crossed over to two meters, connected to a BBS, sent a message to my friend in California. Three hours later, I was sitting on 30 meters and I had my TNC set up where if my call ever went by, it would ring a bell, just so I'd know if anybody's talking about me. The bell went off. I looked down there and there was the message on 30 meters in New Orleans going to California. And he got it two hours after that because I, I call him on the phone to ask him. It's an incredible system. It's amazing. Now, the fellow and myself in California have been exchanging messages now for about two years, and we have a numbering scheme. We number every message so we know if we missed one. We missed one. We've got about 300 and some messages. We've only missed one, and we found out the hard drive crashed on the, com on the computer in California. It's very reliable. I saw a hand up back here. It may not be necessary to know the, the route that something takes before sending it. No, you don't have to know the route. Any way to trace the route that something took and Yes. Yeah, the question is, uh, uh, do you know the route the message took? Um, when the message gets to you, gets to you, it says path, and then list all the calls. And I have seen sometimes as many as 25 calls in the path. You know, when you got solar flares going on, they wind up on short 80-meter hops, and you know, instead of a long 10-meter hop. 
But yes, the path is there, you can see. And it's kind of fun when this fellow and I exchange traffic between here and California. I've seen it go to the East Coast, down to Mexico, and then back to California. I've seen it sometimes go straight through, so you do know the path of it. But when you send the message, all you need to know is what is his home BBS. And it's all automatic. It's incredible. I mean, you go down there and put your TNC on the frequencies where these BBSs are going, and there's just traffic flying everywhere. And you go, how do those little ones and zeros that I put in here come out the other end? But they do. It's incredible. <coughs> you have, along the same lines, you have what's called automatic bulletin forwarding. What that means is, like ARRL bulletins, they go out to all of the BBSs. Um, if you want to send a bulletin, like, say, the Denver Radio Club Ham Fest, we can go into this BBS and say, send it to every BBS in Colorado. Or we can say, send it to every BBS in the four joining states. Or we can say, send it in the entire United States or send it in the entire world. So you can send bulletins. You got something for sale. You see this all the time. You know, I got a gizmo for sale, cheap, and you'll see it go to all U.S. See, so if you got, if you're looking for something to buy, looking for a sale, or in my case, on our 10 meter repeater, we have a, a COR circuit that's so old that Hamtronics doesn't even have a schematic. So I sent a bulletin to all U.S. saying, anybody got a schematic? And I got three replies, I got my schematics. So it's great, and of course, bulletins of general nature are fun to scan through. Uh, the only disadvantage you get people like it on soapbox. You get a lot of that. So you get a lot of garbage in there too. They let that, I mean, somebody that likes to get on a soapbox, what better form than punch a button and it goes through the entire <laughs> world, you know? Yeah. When this, when this uh, no code thing was, uh, you know, before everybody, my God, I never saw so many bulletins on one subject in my life. That was a very controversial one. But anyway, um, it's, it's quite a system. It really is. Um, things that aren't on here are like games. There's a program out that's a chess board. You got a chess board on your screen. Your buddy, wherever he is, has got a chessboard. You move your rook to knight or something, and it changes his screen. And then you type, take that, and that appears on the bottom of his screen. <laughs> and you're going to see a lot more of this, playing games over the air via, via packet. Um, we have one guy in the club that has a Mac and a, um, I guess it's a, uh, an IBM-based PC. Norm, KB0ADG, and he got the idea here not long ago, and he hooked a TNC to each of them in a little radio, and he's transferring files now between the two systems. Now he doesn't have to worry about protocol conversions and all that. It's all done just through the packet link. I thought that was rather novel. You have a lot of utilities on the line. You have call books. If you need somebody's call, you go into one of these BBSs and you type a special format, the guy's call and a special code. And the next day, you'll have the name and address. OK? Um, they have what's called a mod server. They've got several of those around the country. Let's say you've got a radio, and you want to know what mods there are for this radio. Again, you type into your local BBS a special format, which tells the system you want all the mods for your model, and the next day, you'll have them. Really neat. Now, when I bought a 731, I wanted to put the dual band, cross band, and the extended range and all that in it. And I just went in there and typed it in. The next day, I had it. Really neat. Weather. You want to know what the weather is in Dallas? Just go down there and get it. A lot of interesting things. Um, a lot of interesting things you can do. Uh, I was hoping Joe would be back now. But to give you an idea of some of the things you can do, a year or two ago, Joe had packet in this car. And if I couldn't get to him direct on HF, I could connect to a what's called a node, but it's a station somewhere in the United States, and then have it put a link, digital link back to, to Joe's car. So I could always talk to Joe no matter where he was. 
And I had to tell him one day, I logged in, I connected to him, and the answer back I got out of his TNC was, uh, I am hiking in Natural Bridges Park, please leave your message. So I left my message and I said, you know, I feel awful stupid talking to a car 900 miles away. <laughs> then two days later, he had a little HT like that, a little TNC set up on his uh, table in his hotel room. And I'd sit here on two meters, go all the way out there on, various, on the two meter system, connect to his node and say, well, you making any money? You know, things like that, see? Uh, another example is uh, Dave WG Zerin, who you'll all see later on. He'll bring his cam down and demonstrate the Hostmaster for you. Two weeks ago, he was in Seattle, and he had his little HT and his TNC and a little laptop sitting there in the hotel room, and I'd connect to him two, three times a day and see how things were going, all on two meters. And we're going to show you how to do all that stuff. And then the example I uh, brought in to, oh, Joe caused quite a stir our, our last year during our class because we had a station set up and we were talking, and all of a sudden, here's Joe connected to us. Joe was in a hotel room in Omaha with a wire hanging out the window and came in here and connected to the class. And of course it was neat because they all knew Joe. See? Give an example of some of the things you can do. Um, can you uh, just block the light or just aim that thing off to the side for just a minute? Give you an idea of some of the things you can do. I hope you can read this. Last night, I was on two meters with one watt. And I connected to what we call a gateway. It's a way of going from one frequency to the other. And we're going to really go into this, but I connected to this gateway here in Denver on two meters, which happens to cross over to 18105. Okay, 17 meters. I told it to connect. And, and don't worry about this because we're going to go through the step by step, but I just want to show you. I told it to connect to this call. That happens to be a personal BBS sitting on a tanker in the Gulf somewhere. He came back and said, link made. Now, he wasn't there, so it put me into his BBS. So many bytes available. It says, I have mail. So I said, okay, read my mail. Message 39 last night, that's GMT time, from him to me. Bill, thanks for the connect. I had connected him about two hours before and said, uh, where are you at? Where do you run it? And then I, two hours later, this time I went back. See, and he found that message in there. It says, thanks, Bill, for the connect. I am operating from the radio room of the steam tanker Coastal Eagle Point, a 741 foot, 35,000 barrel capacity tanker, constructed in 1960. We carry, and I didn't understand this, we carry Alaskan crude oil to the Gulf Coast from Panama. Now, why Alaskan oil is coming from Panama, I, I don't know. Because they're too big to go through the canal, so they probably pump it over to the other side. Maybe that is, I don't know. Equipment includes a 200 watt shanty, must be oriental, transceiver feeding a 40 foot vertical mounted on the starboard bridge wing of the tanker. The TNC is a KPC2, we'll talk about that. Feel free to use my K node, the call, probably the world's first maritime mobile node. Here's what's neat. Operation will continue until early February when I will return home to Colorado for a few months of R&R. &R. He happens to be from Evergreen. Great. Well, I talked to him this afternoon. So what I did this afternoon, yeah. we've got some AT&T people here. I shouldn't say this, but just before I went on my lunch break, I dialed into my station because I can run my station f from the office. <laughs> I dialed into my station, connected to him and say and asked him, can you meet me at 11.30 during my lunch hour on HF? I'd like to talk to you because I'd like you to tell the class about this. And he said, I'd be glad to. So I went out in the car at 11.30 and we got on uh, 17 meters. And I hope you can hear this. Okay, KF2T, Maritime Mobile, somewhere in the Gulf, W60AV Mobile, Denver. Okay, real fine, George. That was interesting, uh, uploading that message from your, uh, your tanker mobile node there last night, particularly since I was running one watt on two meters and going through the gateway and then out there to you in the, in the Gulf. One of the neat things about packet. 
So you might tell the uh, class uh, where you are and what you're on and uh, what you're running there. KF2T, Maritime Mobile, W6OAV Mobile, Denver. Okay, this is KF2T, Maritime Mobile. Hello, I'm on the Eastern Tanker Coast Legal Point. Uh, 31 feet long. some of the, you know, wild things you can do on packet. So the beauty of packet, and I'm like several people here, I have antenna covenances, and I have two tons of wire in my attic. <laughs> and amazingly enough, I do quite well. I've been surprised. The other day, I walked in the ham shack and I saw my HF radio going. So I thought, well, I wonder who's using me to repeat, called Digi. I wonder who's doing that. So I turned on the monitor, and it was a station in, in uh, France talking to a station in Germany through my indoor antenna. <laughs> See? But the beauty of it is, if you can get a signal out of your place, there's any, any, any packet station that's on the air, you can use as a relay. Now, you do have the capability of defeating that, turning it off, but I know of no ham that has ever turned that off. The other day, I was talking to a guy on the East Coast and he had a beam up 130 feet, and he was running a full kilowatt. And I said, boy, you must put a whale of a signal into Europe. And he says, yeah, I sure do. He says, in fact, I gotta go shopping. He says, I'll swing the beam that way, because you got a good enough signal to come in off the back. Use my station. So I had a great time using this kilowatt in this 130 foot tall tower out there in the East Coast, see? <laughs> so that's the beauty. If you can get a little RF out of your house, if you got restrictions, and grab somebody's node from there, the world is open to you. Uh. Are you talking about HF now with this digipeating? Two meters and HF. We're, we're going to get into all these terms, but well, yeah, but no matter what band you're on. I, I thought, uh, I guess, I have a PK-232, and, mm -hmm. and in the book there, maybe it's a little outdated, I don't know, the rules are always being reinterpreted and stuff. It said that uh, HF digipeating was not uh, permitted. Oh, yeah. It is. It must be. HF. The only thing that's illegal on HF is unattended operation. But that, well, as long as you're there, then you're yeah, talking about Yeah, that. yeah. Okay. But you'll find out that uh, most people ignore that anymore because it's all tied up in politics. They tried to get it through once to get it legal, and it got tied up because they specified frequencies the packet would be on, and people said, no, we don't want to lock it into frequencies. It's got to be more vague. You know, and, and most people said, this is a heck of a network we've got, and why stymie it, you know, with with just being on at certain times and off at certain times, which means you got a network that's coming and going all the time. So most yeah. people leave it on. The FCC, I talked to the FCC guy here not long, well, about two years ago, I guess, on the subject, and his answer was, don't ask the question if you don't want to hear the answer. <laughs> anyway, let's take a coffee break. Uh, everybody know where the coffee shop is? Pro Science. 
Just go out here, take a right, and those of digital topics that have shown up in all of the round tables. So you folks that are not uh, Denver Radio Club members, you can get caught up in a heck of a hurry because we've got all of his articles. The only thing is I did not want to just make a whole bunch of copies and then, you know, have them sitting around. So I'll set around uh, this uh, sheet here just on the back of it if you want it. Uh, just indicate by putting your name on there in your call. And then we'll have copies for you next week. Okay? So uh, that was all. Can we just okay. address specific issues? Because I've got most of the around. I might... Uh, Another thing, if you've got uh, 360 floppies, this stuff is all floppies. If you want to just bring in a floppy, we could copy it for you. I got a ton of floppies. I, I just didn't bring them in. I got oh, okay. floppies all over the place. Well, you might, you might mention on there if you want a floppy instead of hard copies. Yeah, yeah. indicate whether you want floppy or hard copy. I got uh, 360 uh, four and a, or, or five and a quarter. How on that floppy is that? No, no, ASCII files. Straight ASCII, flat ASCII files. You can import it to any word processor. Pardon me? You can read it with WordPerfect, I assume. Oh, I'm, I'm sure you can. Yeah, you can import ASCII files. What are these uh, disks for? I know it, uh, I got a Commodore 64. That's the reason I'm no, no, no. Uh, IBM PC compatible. Okay. Okay? Hey, can somebody flip on the uh, projector again? What did we get here? Connected to Dave just connected to you. After we finish the formal portion of the class, uh, Joe's got the packet station running here. We apologize uh, for the cold breeze coming out there. Uh, Murphy's Law, we got four megs of, of spectrum on two meters. We fired up here the other day and we had a spur and guess where it was? 14501, our main packet frequency. So we had to move the antenna outdoors. <laughs> I live a good life. I don't know what he did to get God as upset, but he's only 22 years old. It's the nightlife that makes him look yeah. like this. <laughs> okay, uh, next one. May need a little focus on that. The... Uh, the question often comes up is, why is it called packet? And it's called packet by virtue of the way the information is delivered. Essentially, when you type a bunch of stuff on the keyboard, and we're, we're really going to go in deep on this stuff later on, but when you type stuff in a keyboard and you hit the carriage return, it takes your information puts the address fields in there, who is it going to and where is it coming from, what kind of information is contained in here, and it puts a magical thing on here called an FCS that we'll get into that allows the other end to determine whether all this stuff got there error-free or not. Okay, so your, your, your information is set in, sent in packets. Um, it's really a misnomer. It it's actually should be called a frame. If you go down to the real rules of AX.25 and X.25, it's a frame, not a packet, but we're not going to get very heavy into that. Uh, but for those of you, maybe you're aware of X.25, it's not a packet, it's a frame, level two, really. We're not going to worry about that now. But the way it works is, you're sitting there typing, it's just like writing a bunch of sheets of paper. And you take the first sheet of paper after you've typed it, you put it into an envelope, and you put your addresses on the front of the envelope, and you put a number on the, pack, on the envelope that says, this is my number one envelope, and you send it to the guy. The guy sends you a postcard back saying, I got it. You say, great. You take the second sheet of paper, because, you know, our post office is getting awful shaky these days. I didn't hear anybody say they worked for the post office. So, <laughs> so I take my second sheet of paper, put it in an envelope, put his address on, my return address. I say, this is envelope number two. I send it out, and I wait for a week, some predetermined time, and I say, well, good old Uncle Sam's post office didn't deliver. I didn't get a postcard back saying that he got it. So therefore, fire up my printer, my computer, reprint that sheet, put it in the envelope. It's still the same number, still envelope number two. I address it. I send it. 
And I get a postcard back saying he got it. Now, instead of a postcard, he may want to start answering me, so he wrote a sheet of paper and he put it in an envelope and sent the envelope back with my address, his return address, and it says it's his number one envelope he just sent me. But he says, I got your number two envelope. So instead of sending a little postcard back saying, I got your packet, he actually sent an envelope containing information, but he also acknowledged my packet, or my envelope. See how that works? And then I send my last sheet of paper. He sends me either an envelope with information plus acknowledging that, or he sends a postcard either way. And then when I'm done, I send a little postcard saying, I'm done. He sends me a postcard back saying, thank you. So we're sending envelopes of information. And that's why it's called packet by virtue of the way it works. Any, any questions on that? Like I say, we're going to get really heavy into this. Um, AX.25 is a worldwide standard. The commercial version is X.25, which you're probably familiar with there. And it really was not designed for radio. It was really designed, X.25 was really designed to run on telephone systems. We don't have all this QRM and the Russian woodpecker and whatever. And so what happened, digital became to the point where we could do it. Memory was getting cheap. Computers were getting cheap. So in 1979, a Canadian group Say, well, we got to develop a digital communications. And basically, we've got two choices. We can invent something or we can modify something. We can modify something very fast. It's going to take us a long time to invent it. So they modified X.25 to AX.25. And basically, within about a year, they had it on the air. In the meantime, in 1980, the Americans down in Tucson got involved in one other place, I forget where now, and came up with standardizations for hardware TNCs and software, AX.25. So in 1982, the hardware was uh, standardized. 1983, the network was uh, standardized. And in 1986, they, what you might say, developed AX.25 to higher levels. It's called levels three and four that we'll basically touch on very briefly later on. So it hasn't been around that long and we've come a long ways. But we got a, lot, a, lot of, a long ways to go yet. But we're gonna see some exciting things going on. Uh, somebody here mentioned light to me. Anyway, there's a new mode called light that's coming out that's much faster, a lot less overhead. There's a system called Clover, yeah, you mentioned it, Clover, that's coming out that's really something. And we're starting to see a lot of breakthroughs, and, and we're going to see some very exciting times here. And in, in, in five, eight years from now, we're going to look at what we are all excited about now and go, oh, boy, you know. Next one? Oh, I'm sorry. We need to back up here. I forgot where I was at. Um, gives you global automatic routing. We've already talked about that. Uh, there's a network uh, not long ago I connected into South America went over to Africa and then went into Europe to talk to a German because I couldn't go direct you tell me the story about well, I Italy. I was testing a path on 10 meters and uh, connected to myself in about 30 seconds on 10 meters via via Italy. Italy. How do you understand German? You said you talked to German. Well, you got QS QSL codes, and, I mean Q codes and all that. He spoke English, fortunately. When I first went on the air with my TNC, I thought it was broken because I would see some packets and I'd see garbage. And I realized I was monitoring two Japanese that were using Japanese characters and my terminal just barfed, <laughs> locked up, the bell rang. The headers were in English, interestingly enough. You know, it had the JA calls, but the, that info frame you were seeing, I mean, that drove my terminal nuts. We talked about this air-free transmission, channel sharing, where you lock people on the same channel, take turns, and multiple links. Uh, you can talk to, most TNCs allow up to 10 
separate conversations. So I could be talking to George and Rick, etc. George wouldn't know I was talking to Rick and vice versa unless they had their TNC condition where they could see other people talking. So you can carry up to 10 simultaneous conversations on your TNC. If you're carrying okay. on two or three conversations, can you send all three guys the same message? You got to change virtual channels that we'll get into. You can't send it to them simultaneously, no. No. I don't know of any software package that allows that. You can automate it where you just hit a key and it goes out there and you hit a key and it goes out there, but it's just automating yeah, keystrokes. No, there is a feature called Roundtable that we're going to get into where you can set it up where when one person transmits, everybody sees it. But there's some limitations to that that we'll get into. So there is a Roundtable mode that kind of does what you're saying. Okay? And we'll cover that later on. Any comments on this, Joe? So in other words, you'd have to send out three different messages if you want to send mm -hmm. the same thing to three different people. You can send out three different messages. Right. You bring up something I forgot to mention earlier. There's another neat thing in Packet, going back several slides, called conferencing. You have conference bridges. And you connect to this conference bridge, and you can ask who's on it. You can send a message to any one individual, or you can send a message to all. And there's a conference bridge in Ohio, since Columbus, Ohio, that I connect to all the time. It's got inputs on 10 meters, 12 meters, 15 meters, 20, 40, and 80, plus three two-meter frequencies. You log in there, and there's people from all over the world on this conference bridge. Okay? So when you type something, and this is the disadvantage of these things, if you type something that goes to everybody, you see your packet go in, and then you see your information go to this guy in Japan, and go to this guy, 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 and to this guy all, you know, separately, one at a time. Well, if you get a lot of that going on, that clobbers the frequency very rapidly. So if you're, you know, in a, in a conference situation, if you only want to address one guy, you should direct it to him so that it doesn't mushroom out. But that's, even conference bridges have that limitation. It doesn't go out simultaneously, one at a time. Okay? How but that's long, neat. How long does it take to send what you got on the board? If you send a message out, I say, how long would it take you to send that out? To send what, this stuff here? Yeah. Well, that, this, that, what you got there. Just a brap. Just what? Just a brap. Get that brap. Quick, huh? Yeah, I would take three seconds. So then all those messages that take three or four seconds to send one to everybody, or does it have about a second or two in between? Oh, there's time in between, depending upon activity on the channel. When we get into this, I, I think you'll see what we're saying. Okay. We're, we're still in the overview mode here. We, you know, tonight is kind of a get acquainted and overview night. And then uh, next Tuesday, we start getting heavy into this stuff. Uh, next one. Okay, some people say, why do we, in about three weeks from now, get really hairy? I mean, we're down in some cases talking about individual bits within a byte. If you don't understand that, we'll define all that later on. Well, the reason you have to understand this protocol is to know how your TNC responds when you change different commands within your TNC. If you've got a TNC, you've got a book about that thick of all the commands. And to optimize your TNC to a given operation on a given frequency and under a given set of conditions, you really have to understand what these parameters change in your TNC and how it operates differently. It's just like if you're going to work on the engine of your car, and you really don't understand it that well, I mean, you could be changing the, the fuel pump when you should be changing the, you know, the, the oil pump or whatever. I mean, you really got to understand it to, to do it well. You can hack along, uh, but you get much more efficient if you really understand how the thing works. Um, it makes you a, a, uh, you know, a real professional operator. Uh, it allows you to troubleshoot what's going on. A very common question I'll get is, how come somebody connects to me, and I sit there and I type away, and it never goes out? And then pretty soon the link goes down. And the guy at the other end never got it. And as far as the guy at the other end concerned, we were never hooked up, and yet my TNC told me we were hooked up. Well, after we go through the protocol, you'll be able to understand why these kinds of things are going on and what to do about it. Okay, so you'll be able to analyze problems, fine tune your system. One nice thing about 
the TNCs, and you'll love this, Rick, being an old data guy, you can make it a link analyzer. You can turn it on and look at different degrees of, of uh, packet communications. And you can analyze what's going on. I don't know how many times I've used mine when somebody's called me to watch what's going on to tell them what's happening. Uh, Dave WG0N, who will be here later on, uh, had a problem today and I turned my TNC on and we analyzed very rapidly what was going on. If you don't understand the protocol, well then all you see is all this funny stuff going by and it doesn't mean anything to you. Any questions on that? Okay, next one. This one I don't think is in your handouts because this was a slide I made and lost the master of. Um, basically, just to give you an overview of the network, if you were to consider this to be the telephone system, this would be your house this would be your mother-in-law's house, okay? Now, assuming you want to place a call to your mother-in-law, you would pick up your telephone, and this pair of wires in here to your local central office, your local exchange office, would signal this office to give you dial tone. Then you would dial the numbers to set up a link. This telephone office, let's say it's here in Inglewood, says, ah, he wants to talk to uh, Lakewood. So it gets you a channel, there's hundreds of them here, thousands, whatever, <laughs> to the central office in Lakewood. And then it sends a ring out here, rings the phone, and your mother-in-law picks it up. Okay? So you have a path. This is your local loop. This is what's called a trunk. Now, let's say I got 100 channels, and we got 100 people here talking. Well, when I pick up my phone and dial old mom-in-law over there, the central office knows it can't get me there. So it sets up a link to Wheat Ridge, let's say. Since I'm not a member of U.S. West, I don't know. Joe? I have no idea. I'm not network. <laughs> See, he's, an, he's X, A, T, and T. He's a, he's a turncoat. Not a good job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got honest work. <laughs> well, since he's been over there, you've been to what, Paris and other exciting places? I get to go to New Jersey. You go to Paris. You got a maid. Anyway, this office says, ah, I got to take, get him back down here to Lakewood. That's called alternate routing. Okay? If I can't get you direct, I will send you via an alternate route. Now, in packet, we have the equivalent here. This is a radio. And we had, have what's called a node. I type in to my radio something like connect me to node B. And node B will answer me. I tell node B, connect me to, let's say, uh, Pueblo. Well, if the path is good, he will connect me to this node. And I'll get a message back telling me that I'm connected. And I'll tell this node, connect me to W6ABC. And I'll get a message back telling me. Now, let's say this path is faded. This node has a routing table in it. It says, well, I can't get to Pueblo Direct, but I can go to Grand Junction and then down. I don't know that here. I just told it connect me to Pueblo, and pretty soon it comes back. There are ways I can tell when we'll get into this, but we have what's called alternate routing. Okay? Bill, does that guy have to be on the list there to be connected to? Like, you know, you said you no, there's no list involved. I told this node to connect to this node, and after it did it, I told this node to connect to him. Yeah, he sends out a call if I this guy is there. Well, I have to know he's there. That's what I say. Yeah. 
the there are ways to find out. Okay. Like I say, we're in the overview mode now, but okay. I can ask who's down there and then tell us connect to him. But yeah, I have to know he's there, or I can just take a blind stab at it. Okay. The concept we're trying to get across here is not so much how to do it as what is a, a node and what are these things called in this packet network, okay? And then we're really going to get into this, but when I connect to a node, it's called an uplink. I establish an uplink here. I establish a circuit here. I establish a downlink here. Now this is important because later on when you're exploring the network, you're going to be seeing these terms pop up on your screen when you're asking this node who's around and how are they connected if they are, things like that. What was the, what was the, the term for the connection between the two nodes? The term for the connection between the two nodes is called a circuit. You'll hear Ham's talking about I'm going to connect to this guy or I'm going to connect to the node or I'm going to set up a link to this guy. So link is kind of an overall connection. Now connection sounds funny. When we get into the protocol, you'll see what's going on. Because like I say, if I connect to 10 different guys, I have 10 channels, 10 real channels separate working, but they're all in the same radio channel. And if we take a look at the next slide, I think you'll see that concept. Okay, let's say that we've got these users sitting here. We got user A, user B, and user C. All three of these guys connect to this node. So user A sends his packets as well as user B and C to this node here. Okay. All three of these guys are typing all at the same time. These TNCs know when the channel is idle. And when it's idle, station A sends out his first packet, becomes idle, B sends out his first packet, becomes idle, C sends out his first packet, becomes idle, there's the second packet from A, second packet from B, etc. One right after the other. Okay, that's called channel sharing. If I come up and I want to use the channel and nobody's got it, I grab it. And there's a neat algorithm that we'll get into. If two stations happen to come up instantaneously, they'll drop down. One of them will always come up before the other. It's a mathematical thing. It's really neat. So that's called packet sharing. Now we get to this node, and user A's packets are going on a downlink to a station. B and C, their packets are coming here because this link has gone away, faded out or something. See, normally A would have gone here, B and C would have come here, like so. Everybody see that concept? So we got a little, we got alternate routing involved for two of these users down to here, and then this node on some frequency is taking turns. He's sending B1 here, C1 here, B2 here, C2 here, etc. So we have three users that are coming into here, going down here in this timeshare mode, then one being split off, the other two coming down here, and then being split off here. So this shows the concept of frequency sharing, or another term is called uh, time division, each person's got their own little time slots, as well as alternate routing because this path here is down. Any questions on that? Uh, I'm just curious, can these, uh, these nodes now when you're using them, is this alternate routing, is that a, something that you accomplish because you know which nodes have access to which other nodes? Or is that something that's automatic? Something that's automatic. These nodes sit here and tell each other what they can hear. And I'm going to show you how to go in here later on and ask a node, how are you going to get me to Salt Lake City? 
and he may say, I got four different ways to try. First choice, second, third, and fourth. This node puts out a special ID. This node hears it. He says, oh, I hear that node, so I can get to him. This node tells this node, I hear this node. So here's the situation where this node hears him ID. This node hears him ID. So he knows that anybody wants to go here, I'll go here. Anybody wants to go over here, I'll go that way. This node also tells this node, I can hear him. So now this node says, aha, I know I can go direct, and if I can't make it direct, I know that he hears this node. They continually update each other. If you pull the plug on this node, pretty soon he says, I've waited the right amount of time. I haven't heard him ID. So either he is gone or the band is gone. I'm taking him out of my routing table. Two hours later, the sysop plugs him back in, does a special ID, and he says, ah, I hear him back in the routing table. He's dynamic. Okay. Where are these nodes located at? In the TNC or what? Compute, there can be anything you want. There's TNCs, computers, there's all kinds of them. But the routing, those routing decisions are really made by TNC, right? It's made by the software. Uh, TNCs can have EPROMs that are put into them to make them operate as a node. Computers have programs in them that make them a act as a node. Uh, anything else you can think of, Joe? So, uh, you know, no, any... It's, uh, it's, it's a piece of software. Eventually, it has to be connected to a TNC of some sort. Whether or not that software mm -hmm. resides within the TNC or whether it resides on an external computer, eventually it has to get to a TNC so we can go to a radio. Speak a little louder. Hello. <laughs> I'm not getting friendly. I just... Yes, well, I, I'm beginning to back up here a little. Anyway, next week, we're actually going to talk. If you look at the next... Uh, go ahead and put the next slide up. Give you a flavor. We're going to start talking about the questions you're asking. TNCs, computers, radios, this network. So we're going to spend a lot of next Tuesday going into all this stuff. And then the, probably the following Tuesday, we're going to start talking about all these packets and how they work. Maybe two weeks on that. And then from there, we're going to go into the, the network itself. How do you connect to it? How do you query this network about who does it here? Where can I go? How can I get there? Uh, you know, these kinds of things. Okay? And then from there, uh, we'll spend some time talking about some of the radios and TNCs and then start demoing the stuff after that. So we'll start going fast and furious and getting heavy next week. Any questions on any of the stuff we've covered uh, tonight? Looks like it stopped snowing out there. It was looking pretty bad about a half hour ago, an hour ago. But. Yeah? Oh, yes. Uh, we are very fortunate here. The question is, uh, are we going to have makeup classes if we miss? We are very fortunate here. We essentially had this classroom as long as we want it. So we're not in a bind like we were. There's no way we can really make it up uh, in the sense of going faster because we're going to go fast as it is. So we'll just basically uh, uh, plan on about nine to ten weeks, seven weeks or so of, of the theory stuff with a lot of demos. We're going to have the packet station set up so as we project slides and we show you how to do it, we'll have monitors set up and one of these overhead projectors that fits on here so the screen is projected on the wall so you guys can see because we don't want 35 people crowded around this little laptop here. <coughs> That's a little too cozy. So we'll have monitors and everything set up and we'll, as we cover each item on the slide, we'll actually demo it on the radio here. And as, since it's being videotaped, if we have to, I'm going to have to miss a class or two. Is there a way of, of, of maybe borrowing the video to mm -hmm. catch up? It'll be at the DRC. It will? Okay, great. Yeah, I might mention we already have a set of, sli of uh, tapes from the last class. Okay. Uh, for that reason, anybody could check it out anytime they wanted. The problem we had last time is uh, I had a microphone, a wired mic instead of this thing, and they laid on the podium, and I like to walk. <laughs> so most of the time you couldn't hear me because I, you know, or I'd pick it up and then I'd hit the end of the cord and unplug it, or, you know. <laughs> so this ought to come out very well, and, and, and that's the purpose of it review and, and whatever. 
Keith, one question that came up. Um, is it verboten to bring coffee from there to here? No problem. Oh, okay. No problem. We can do that. All righty. Uh, anybody got any questions before we uh, go away? Are you going to have uh, printouts of the wiring of the hookups, in other words, steam eggs for the hookups? Uh, how are you hooking it up? Yeah, it's, it's in there now. We're going to go over it. If you don't have it, some of you don't have complete uh, issues yet, you will be getting it.